Hello, everyone. I am Park Davis. I mean, no, I'm Melanie O'Bear, and I will be your MC this evening. So tonight's presentation um, is by Ian and Michelle Torrey, who've been NSC members since 2003. Tonight, they'll share with us the good, the bad, and the ugly of their transition from full-time jobs to being full-time live-aboard nomads. And their presentation is built on photos, all taken by Michelle, who's a very talented photographer, and Ian will be our narrator. So before doing a complete 180 in lifestyle, uh, Ian was a military physician and Michelle was a project manager in disaster recovery, which, as Ian says, is an important talent when being married to him. Plus, I know that those skills come in handy uh, for the liveaboard life. So I'm super excited to hear their story this evening, and I think tonight will be a good example of, as Ian says, how time flies when you're drinking rum. I mean, having fun. Over to you, Ian. Okay, so hi all. I'm glad that you could uh, join us tonight. This talk was uh, purposefully of, to uh, designed to avoid deep dives but rather we're going to try to attempt to capture some of the variety and dimension of nomadic liveaboard cruising, while hopefully also inserting some pearls of wisdom along the way. We'll follow the outline shown here, but you'll be really happy to hear that this is the only slide with writing on it. I'll be narrating this talk and both Michelle and I will be on afterwards for the Q and A. And all the really good photos are by Michelle because um, she takes great pictures. Uh, that's also why she's not in a lot of them. Okay. So, by way of an introduction to us, let me start with a very short bit regarding our philosophy. First, a question of, for you. In this photo, am I returning from a pleasant swim or uh, off a nearby reef, or did I just clean the bottom? I'll tell you what it was a little later. This brings me to the observation. You've all likely heard that nomadic or liveaboard cruising is really just performing repairs in exotic locations. Well, I'm here to tell you that that is true, but only partly true, uh, because stuff happens and you're gonna have to fix it regardless of where you are. The only difference is your ability to get parts and professional help. And by the way, it needn't ruin a trip. Like most things, it's all about attitude. At first, we had to make a conscious effort to look for the positive aspects when things seem to always be breaking and our well-laid plans were getting disrupted. Since retiring to the boat, we have found that we've been able to slow down a bit and now seek the pleasure and even the humor in even the most unlikely situations. In fact, some of our best memories and closest friends stemmed from what we would have considered totally awful situations. If you look for the positive, you'll find it. Of course, we all know the converse is true too, and we are not totally immune. Um, Gary, our lovable curmudgeon and port officer for the Ocean Cruising Club in Norfolk, nailed it when he looked over at our boat, sitting quietly in its slip, and he said, you know, something's breaking on your boat right now. So, when long-term cruising, something is always trying to fail or break, but it provides a challenge to fix the problem or come up with a workaround. Most breakdowns don't stop you dead. Framed as a challenge or a learning opportunity rather than a setback, and a chance to perhaps get to know other cruisers or locals is an unplanned reward. This picture is of Michelle on her birthday after we just removed the holding tank. Oh, yay. <laughs> we also learned from our friend Pete that Aspirations are better than plans. That makes it easier in your mind to change course if something draws you off in a different direction or you've been held up. Okay, in this picture, I have a big smile having just cleaned the bottom. I got some exercise and got to go for a big dip in the, in the, cool, in the cool water. And what's not to like? Um, by the way, 
note that we carry nine gallons of fuel in the dinghy, and that gives us an enormous range when we're exploring. Okay, so who are we and what's our background? At 28, Michelle started sailing and racing in Newfoundland on a CNC 38, an expo, and a few other larger yachts. She raced on, um, on a J35 through to a Swan 48 as we bounced around North America, fear of the Canadian forces and your tax dollar. Um, arriving at NSC, she jumped into racing in many of the local fleets, as you can see. I've been on the water for most of my life. I cruised with my folks early on, but as soon as my brother and I found out about racing, well, we were gone. I've raced both dinghies and keelboats, done inshore and offshore racing. I became a crew on several professional race boats and was a sailmaker way back in the 80s before getting a real job. After racing our first keelboat, Bad Kitty, uh, for a couple of years at NSC, almost on a lark, we bought Starlight, a CNC 30, and switched to cruising. Starlight was just perfect for us on Lac de Chine, and she was set up um, perfectly for this area. Many of you will remember us uh, doing barbecues off the back of the boat at the weather mark on weeknight races. Ain't we stinkers? So the notion of sailing full-time after retirement was actually hatched in about 2005. We were thinking about retirement way in the future, as mil military people often do. Um, we were already pretty comfortable moving residences every few years, thanks to the military. Um, also in the back of my mind, I had that my dad had passed away just before he could start to enjoy a well-planned retirement. So I didn't want that to happen to me. And a close sailing friend of the family had lasting regrets after not doing this kind of a voyage when he was young and fit enough to do so. So the first big question was, um, I had offshore experience, but how would Michelle be doing offshore? Okay. So we created Trial Balloon, a delivery with Michelle back from the 2006 Newport to Bermuda race on a 48 foot custom IRC race boat. <clears throat> All was well the first two days with spinnaker and clear skies, but a tropical depression that we knew about before leaving arrived on day three and made the Gulf Stream very angry. Uh, several boats were dismasted or damaged. We surfed large breaking seas through the night but came through unscathed. Michelle stayed on deck the entire time. Afterward, she said, that really scared me. But if that's as bad as it gets, I think we can do this. And that's pretty good for someone who's kind of scared of the water. Uh, this photo was taken as the seas were starting to rise ahead of the storm that was coming. Um, so the first lesson, fixed schedules are the most dangerous thing on a cruising boat. Right then, we're in. Start dreaming the dream. Now to start the process. When, where, how? Why not the world? Uh, soon it became clear that that was too big an elephant to eat in one bite. Instead, how about let's do the U.S. East Coast and Caribbean, and then we'll see where that takes us. Uh, but let's get a boat that's capable of crossing oceans, and we'll set up a loose five-year plan with annual re-ups. So how comfortable do we need to be? Catamaran, a monohull, form stability, displacement, amenities, on and on and on the list of decisions was growing. Um, what do we want to spend on the boat? And as importantly, what do we want to spend while traveling? After all, we are on a military pension. Do we want to anchor off all the time or occasionally use a marina? Or perhaps even bake in some shore holidays or hotels? Uh, costs can skyrocket depending on how regal we want it to be. Incidentally, I recommend Beth Leonard's book on voyaging as a good first place to start grappling with the logistics of living on board a, in a modern boat. We decided a middle of the road approach whereby we plan for staying in a facility about once a month for a night or so. And in the end, we stayed at marinas when the spirit moved us, uh, which was less than we thought. Uh, but at times we'd stay a little bit longer than, it's, than, than we'd planned. Uh, and it really turned out to be a non-issue. Um, 
So we carried on doing a whole lot of enjoyable research. We talked to folks who have been out there doing it. We took winter charters, uh, and then we took longer cruises up the river. We looked at blogs and blogs and web websites of people who are out there. And of course, we scoured Yacht World and other online resources for boat candidates. Okay. Now to get to the right boat, the basic tenets, no boat will be perfect and certainly not for two people with differing priorities like Michelle and I. Therefore, we made a prioritized list of the must-haves, the want-to-haves, the nice-to-haves, but as well, the must-not-haves. Then we critically reviewed them. And this got us into the ballpark uh, for general size and type of boat. I admit, we thought with our heart and not just with our brain, as there's gotta be some love to get you through those hard days. We uh, pictured how we wanted to be when we were both underway, in the sun, rain, at night, in a storm, as well as at anchor or alongside. And we found that there was an awful lot of old, old salt information out there that didn't really hold true anymore since boats uh, and construction have evolved a lot in the last few decades. These newer designs come with their own special issues as well. They're not, they're not free of problems. Um, so for our dream, we wanted ocean crossing capability. If we knew that we were only gonna do coastal cruising, the calculus would have been much different and uh, virtually any, any production boat would work just fine. So the boats that are in the picture, um, many of you probably recognize at least some of them. There's an outbound 46 in the upper left, um, a Halberg Rossi 43, surprisingly a Santa Cruz 50, which we almost bought and I'm really glad we didn't, and uh, a Bristol 47.7. After four years of active search, uh, in 2012, we settled on what would soon become Mahina. She's a 2003 late production run, highly customized and Canadian built Saga 43 that was uh, located in North Carolina. It was a substantial benefit to have very knowledgeable and gregarious previous owners who had many long voyages under their belt. They customized the boat during their build and really knew what they wanted in a cruising boat. So, here we are at the all important renaming festivities. Note that the, note the substantial folding table in the foreground. It is in the correct place for a footrest when we're heeled over. And it was engineered from the start as an attachment point for safety tethers. So why the Saga 43? Well, number one, it was in our snack bracket. Uh, we could afford it. We, Reed Michelle, did not want to camp, so it had many conveniences. Uh, it didn't feel like a cave when you went down below. Uh, it had a versatile and really quite easy to handle sail plan. Um, had independent ports, stringers, bulkheads, and floors that were fully glassed in, vice the common prefab uh, glued in grid. Uh, and it was designed specifically for a couple to sail offshore by Bob Perry with a lot of input from the cruising community. And therefore, it had a great track record. Plus, the Saga has not got a stick of wood on the deck, so there's no varnishing. It also has high lifelines and solid rails around the cockpit for the Dodger, which you can just start to make out in the, in the photo. Uh, there's good foul weather gear protector or foul weather protection in the cockpit, but also all windows can zip out of the California style Dodger for warm weather. And there's hand grabs and granny bars everywhere that you need them. There's also a really slick arch and davit system. We didn't initially think the arch was desirable due to the added weight and windage, but it turned out to be one of the best features. The arch holds all kinds of things like antenna, solar panels, and radar, but also is part of a dinghy handling system that lets us stow, launch, and recover the dinghy in seconds rather than minutes. And that's with a 15 horsepower outboard and fuel tank still mounted. The raised dinghy can be locked to the arch and it also blocks the walk through at night, making it a less likely target for theft. The Saga is also easily managed by two and has a really nice motion in a seaway due to a relatively narrow 12 foot beam. It never pounds to weather. Uh, pretty fast too, with an ample Solent rig and twin furlers. Uh, Mahina has uh, air conditioning, reverse cycle heaters, 
a water maker, a gen set, large inverter, propane stove with oven, refrigeration, freezer, large comfortable berths, and good tankage and storage for a couple to live well. The mast height uh, and draft allow us the flexibility to barely, but we can transit most of the intercoastal waterway if we needed to. What we don't like, because it's narrow and therefore with less form stability, she'll lay over in a breeze more than many newer or beamy designs. Early reefing is required, but like most things on this design, reefing is easy. Uh, with a six foot seven draft, she's also deepish, although that has never really been a problem for us either in the intercoastal waterway or the Bahamas. So in May 2000, or, uh, 2013, Mahina left from Oriental, North Carolina for West River, Chesapeake Bay. Michael Hoffman and Nick Bluen were my able crew. Michelle was shore crew, arranging provisions, the permit to proceed, towboat US membership, and meeting us with a car at the destination. We weren't 12 feet off the dock before we were stuck in the mud. And this was because there was a strong northeasterly wind that had emptied a lot of water from Pamlico Sound. We were many hours under tow while the towboat used its prop wash to dig us a trench for over a mile. You can ask Michael or Nick as well about the lightning strike that happened just in front of the towboat. So lesson learned, towboat US membership is money really well spent if you're traveling really anywhere on the US East Coast. As they say, don't leave home without it. Once underway, we went up a stretch of the intercoastal waterway to Norfolk. In the ICW, you'll need um, portable or cockpit VHF, and we'll become very comfortable speaking to bridge tenders and other boats who are requesting either a slow or a fast path. And no, they don't all ask. And this is one of the very uh, many opening bridges. The delivery continues. Once we got to Norfolk, we continued out into the lower Chesapeake. It was time to sail, all right. But surprise, the electronic chart plotter chip had charts only to the entry to Chesapeake Bay. So lesson learned, know your nav system before you go. Uh, glad we had paper charts. Uh, I took waypoints from the paper charts and transposed them onto the chart plotter world map so we could have a reference at the helm um, as we travel through the night. So this is almost a black screen, but if you look to the upper left, um, about a third of the way down, you might see a little bit of light. The wind came up that night to the point that we were doing five and a half knots under bare poles and heavy rain. And uh, we had a nearish miss with a tug and a tow because I wasn't yet conversant with the really convoluted radar system. Fortunately, we spoke on the radio in plenty of time and the tug could see us on his radar and he advised us of a course change for a safe passage in a very kind way. Uh, lessons to be learned and relearned. The most dangerous thing on a cruising yacht is a schedule. We could have, should have delayed this passage until daylight. Okay, I'd like to say this is what we looked like when we arrived, but I don't have a picture because it was raining so hard, but we arrived safely at West River. Uh, we had a long distance affair with Mahina until 2014 when I was posted to Washington, D.C., dragging Michelle with me. And this was part of our cunning plan. We brought, uh, this brought us to less than 30 minutes away from Mahina. So we could really get more comfortable with both sailing and learning her systems and nuances. Now a bit of the interior boat porn for those who are interested. As I said earlier, this was our time to start to get to know Mahina intimately. Lessons learned during this time. The big one was compared to previous boats, an offshore cruising boat can be very complex and demands a lot of attention. On the plus side, what seems like a big boat quickly starts to become surprisingly manageable after a little time aboard. Um, this photo shows the main bulkhead, which is tabbed into the hull and deck, uh, as well as the keel step mast with a deck to keel tie down behind it. Laminated door frames are curved to reduce the point loading on the bulkhead. Lots of little attention to detail. Although we have reverse cycle air conditioning um, and heating, that little oil lamp puts out a lot of heat on its own and gets more use than the heater. It also provides a wonderful ambiance on the cockpit table where we often have dinner with a view. There are handholds that we can actually reach on the ceiling, on the table, and behind the settees. And there are leak cloths permanently fitted to the, and stowed beneath the seat cushions on both settees. 
uh, as well as in the aft cabin. There's a nice forward master berth for when we are anchored or alongside. Note the steps to get into the bed, which are important for short people like us. And also note the fan to keep us cool. We use the fans and hatches far more than the air conditioning. Um, there are two hatches and two opening port lights in this cabin. And uh, the forward hatch, when you open it, just gives you a beautiful breeze right down onto your face. Also note lots of drawers and storage cubbies. To the galley. Sinks close to midline. Uh, sinks, sink, sorry, sinks are close to midline where they should, should be. Uh, so you don't get water coming in when you're heeled over. Uh, most of the robust opening port lights are at eye height for, for people like us. Um, note the bar across the gimbal stove for the galley harness. Did I say that the boat heels? Um, aside from the high half bulkhead, you'll notice the stainless tube, which is a cabin top tie down that takes the travel load right down to the heel stringers. The nav station is not perfect, uh, being on the end of the couch, but it's not too crazy. Uh, at Anchor, we use a, a personal computer and Noble Tech routing software to do plan routing. But underway, we do most of our plotting at the helm using a touch screen plotter. This is the main electrical panel. The photo hints at the complexity and the need for great organization and labeling, because inevitably, sometime you're going to need to get your nose in there. And this is the high amperage side of the house. It is under the aft cabin berth. It is clear, labeled, and easy to access and understand, even for me. We have several radios. The VHF and single sideband need to connect to a GPS system in order for automated distress and digital selective calling to function. Uh, all VHF functions need to be available on deck, hence the command mic in the picture to the right. Um, disregard the dragonfly. We now um, also have a waterproof, full function, portable VHF, a handheld with a built-in GPS. We use this in the dinghy or as a spare on deck, and it otherwise lives in the di ditch bag, uh, which would go in the life raft. Electricery still has an air of black magic for me, but at least I can probe the system. Good manuals are key. The previous owner left 10 indexed binders full of them on board. I had only a little experience with water makers in my early days and none of it was good, but this baby is awesome. And it puts out 17 gallons an hour and can be sustained on the solar power. It really provides freedom as uh, well as trustworthy water. We clean out our tanks annually with inexpensive Milton's tablets that are used for cleaning breast milk expressing equipment. The residue is potable and it really works. Finally, a reasonable but not spectacular access to the engine from uh, the front and also over the uh, aft cabin, uh, through the aft cabin after the mattress is removed. This allows me to easily access the heat exchanger, starter, alternator, raw water pump, but access to the high pressure injection pump is going to be a real challenge when I have to do it. I guess it's going to be when, not if, right? Um, did I say a boat was a compromise? Okay, Michelle wanted me to mention that our maintenance standard was pretty high, but I know there's people out there laughing right now, but uh, that's because we were traveling to places that wouldn't uh, likely have repair facilities, nor easy access to parts. So in this picture, we have soda, soda blasted the bottom, uh, interprotected and anti foul And done. Lessons learned from a frugal Scotsman like me it was so worth the money to have the bottom professionally soda blasted rather than sanding it ourselves. And it comes out at 80 grit, rough, ready to paint. Ah, it's always good to have a pretty model to help show off the new toys. This was the first of our two banks of solar power. These are flexible and are held on with Velcro envelopes. We rarely worry about electricity anymore. Uh, the time while living in Washington gave us the opportunity to really get to know the system. Here's my elf working on the macerator. Some fun, eh, Bambi? I'd be remiss if I didn't mention Cameron. Uh, he's in Maryland, and he's rebuilding an early 70s golf star in the background. Though his specialty is marine electrical, he's a skilled fiberglass and composite guy, a plumber, a diesel mechanic, 
and skilled in just about everything else one could possibly need to do on a boat. And he was very generous with his time and we've become really good friends. It's folks like him that make the toughest jobs seem doable. And it's just amazing the fine people that you meet. Um, a failed automatic transfer switch ran shore power through our generator, ultimately requiring removal and repair ashore. Removal wasn't a, wasn't a pleasant experience and took the best part of a day with Cameron, but the satisfaction of figuring this out and the self-sufficiency it brought was well worth it. It's so much easier to do stuff on the bench, by the way. Uh, while out, we rebuilt or replaced anything that was remotely likely to be a problem. Uh, firing it up on the bench while it was connected to an oscilloscope and Cameron's car, uh, which provided the starter battery, was also a real adventure. We did the, we, uh, did the navigation system upgrade early on in order to have time to play with it. We often used radar on clear days in Chesapeake Bay just to get used to what it was showing us. Um, we also used ra radar to track squalls. There's so much more that we dealt with before departing. Uh, new air conditioning units, new sails, we stripped and painted the mast, replaced the mast wiring, uh, standing rigging, rebuilt the windlass and gen set and on. And on. Um, but by doing most of it myself or with able guidance from Cameron, uh, mostly, uh, I learned intimately how to diagnose and uh, most importantly, how to fix issues. Whew. Thanks for the reminder, Karen and Corey. We combined uh, shoreside maintenance with wonderful cruising grounds in the Chesapeake to really learn how we wanted to live aboard. We concluded the Saga 43 is just about perfect for our needs. But like any sailor, we do think about what we could do with a few more feet. Hey, Michelle, they did make a Saga 48. Uh oh, I think our, we, we've lost. <laughs> okay, there we go. We'll see what we can come up with here. Okay. Uh, the Chesapeake offered lots of time to use the full inventory of our sails. We found the asymmetrical spinnaker was a better all round solution than using a code zero on the outer force day, even though both work at roughly the same downwind angles. By summer 2017, everything's done that makes sense to be done in the time allotted. We're ready to move back to, from, from uh, DC to Ottawa, retire and head out. So I retired. We moved back to Ottawa just long enough to get our stuff into storage. Since we were moving on to Mahina, we felt there was really no sense in buying a house. Ready, set, and stop. This is Hurricane Irma. The Caribbean, including the Bahamas, as well as many spots on the Atlantic seaboard and intercoastal waterway were destroyed. With nowhere to go, we decided there was no option but to haul an overwinter Mahina in the Chesapeake. It seems opportunities often present themselves just when you need them to. Um, through a good friend, we fell into a perfect cat sitting and house sitting opportunity in Dunrobin for the winter of 2017. This set the stage and uh, we have since had several opportunities to pet and house sit and consequently take some shore leaves. It's been great. Uh, and something that we would never have done in a million years. But uh, it has just, it's been a lot of fun. Uh, this is Heidi. She was 17 years old when the picture was taken. Totally deaf, but very pleasant. Okay, spring of 2018. With the pet sitting over, we made sure all our stuff was still safely in storage. And then back to Mihina we went with a plan to head north to Maine for the summer. Okay, now, ready, set, go. Leaving Chesapeake Bay was kind of a big deal, I gotta say, knowing that we were leaving with no return plan. We soon fell into a routine with Michelle covering daily uh, and weekly weather, um, possible destinations, global timings, and for those who know her, she's also the safety elephant. I took on navigation, routing, maintenance, boat consumable, consumables, and messy technical boat jobs. We both did provisioning, cooking, cleaning, and all kinds of other stuff. 
Um, most of our northbound traveling consisted of day hops. There's so much diversity that taking day trips rather than passages is actually very pleasant. But sometimes weather windows and timings pushed us offshore for longer passages. Uh, the lesson from the Army, don't stand when you can sit, don't sit when you can lie down. Um, the bottom line, don't underestimate the need for good sleep hygiene when passage making. Once we got to Cape May at the mouth of the Delaware, we were offshore by about 25 miles to get into the Gulf Stream. If there's any concern, we have a very low threshold to wear harnesses and com comfortable spin lock PFDs. Reaching in 20 to 25 knots is glorious, but there's almost big seas off the New Jersey coast. Wave period and direction are as important as height, and this is off Atlantic City. Um, this is when we discovered that the new personal AIS locator beacons on our personal flotation devices were not really set up correctly, and one was triggered due to the motion. It came up as an alarm on the chart plotter, and we were hailed by a nearby boat, so at least we knew it worked. Um, turns out that the arming instructions uh, left out a critical step, but this is a point that I, I can actually make that when calling the marine suppliers, particularly the people who are making the, the products, they have all been really helpful about helping work through problems uh, virtually anywhere we were. So I highly recommend the personal AIS for any crude coastal or offshore work. Uh, this automatically deployed beacon will show a man overboard on nearby chart plotters to about seven miles out. It will also send out a shriek on all DSC equipped VHF radios in range. But unlike an EPIR beacon, it is instant and continuously updates its position. All's well that ends well. Atlantic City, here we come. There's quite some surf at entrances along the New Jersey coast, depending on the wind and tide. You need you need power and you need a wee bit of courage. That wasn't too bad. The next day, Michelle captures another perfect day. Mahina is running her easting down to New York City. He takes great photos. The fireboat welcoming, wel welcoming committee to the Big Apple was pretty cool and totally coincidental. Lots of shipping and separation zones to keep track of on the approaches. Although it's advisable to stay just outside the shipping channels, there are lots of commercial fishing boats that can pop out of the fog. As a rule, the fishing boats do not run with their AIS on. There's something special about viewing Lower Manhattan from your own boat. Up the East River, through Hell's Gate, into Long Island Sound. The trip up Long Island uh, Sound was uneventful with a nice stop in Newport, Rhode Island. Through the Cape Cod Canal, we had a great stop at the Provincetown Festival and then over to Marblehead, Massachusetts to hang with my brother. 1,500 boats in, or more in Marblehead in the summer and no obvious channel anywhere. Ah, finally a quick hop down east to Maine, the promised land. The white trawler is gizmo for those who follow the Panbo Marine Electronics blog. There's no shortage of opportunity to meet other cruisers for socializing and sundowners. Uh, maybe sometimes more than one sundowner. In fact, it's too easy to fall into an unhealthy alcohol habit while living aboard. The good news is that we usually use insulated mugs and can drink water or soda without anyone knowing. Oh, so now you know. Speaking of friends that you might come across, this is Bernie and Lynn, who used to be members at NSC. We had been talking about meeting up for several years. We also crossed paths numerous times with other NSC couples um, in the Bahamas, uh, such as uh, Ian and Lynn aboard Windward. Maine was so pretty, we have to show a few shots at Michelle took. This is Biddeford Pond in Maine. You can tell the photos, Michelle took. Um, though not as dramatic as the Bahamas, the moonshine was sometimes very bright. And unlike Chesapeake Bay, there be rocks, not mud, 
and tides are taking on a more prominent role in our planning. Kayaks have proven safe on deck and a nice diversion. I wouldn't cross an ocean with them on deck though. Perhaps maybe inflatable stand-up paddle boards would be better. In Maine, there are lobster pots everywhere. You need a cutter on the prop, even if you're extremely careful, since the lobstermen often have a main float and then a toggle float on each trap. The aim is to pass just down current of the smaller toggle float. Good luck. Lots of schooners in Penobscot Bay. It can be quite spectacular with a dozen or more of these wind jammers on the horizon. Maine is rough and rugged, but has loads of coves to hide out in if the dirty weather is coming. It reminded us of the best of the Maritimes, but with more bays and harbors. Everywhere we stopped was special. For the most part, it was very much less populated than Chesapeake. Along the way, we meet lots of liveaboards and shorter term cruisers many of whom have become long-term friends that we continue to see and connect with as we travel. Boat cards with email and other contact information proved really helpful. Uh, thanks, Corey and Karen, for the cards. When living aboard, sometimes you do end up between a rock and a hard place. Fog is synonymous with travel in Maine. You need to be comfortable with radar, AIS, and situational awareness as it can roll in extremely quickly. Having practice with radar and AIS in the clear weather really increased our confidence when we hit the thick stuff. Uh, can you see the boat in the fog just to the starboard of the pulpit? But August through October, fog is rare-ish. And when it's nice, it can be very, very nice. Stunning. Let me remind you that Michelle's the photographer. Uh, this is the back bay in Castine, Maine. And I think our slideshow is locked up. Oh, there we go. Back on again. When going ashore in Maine, we must be cognizant of tides. On a rocky shore like this, we anchor the dinghy off with a stern anchor and a long line to shore. Pretty romantic though, eh? We frequently traveled in company and met loads of folks, all with great stories and sharing in our adventure. It was common uh, to split for a while and then reconnect down the trail. This happens to be my brother who accompanied, accompanied us from Marblehead, Massachusetts to Maine. She's a fully restored 1963 Hinkley 41. That's great for glamping uh, for a week or maybe two, but wouldn't be well suited to living aboard like we do. Close up of the sterns. Um, both are cruising boats, but set up for different purposes. Note the freeboard, walk-through stern, davit system, solar array, effective dodger, and bimini. They're all big pluses for liveaboard and passage making comfort. Then look at how exposed you are in the cockpit of Chinook, regardless of the dodger. He's awfully pretty though. Eventually all good things must end. Hurricane season is almost over and we wanted to get back to Annapolis for the boat show. Ah damn, another schedule. Uh, note the cross bracing on the dinghy. We have never had to remove either the dinghy or the outboard while passage making, though I would do so for an ocean crossing. Uh, these are the twin lights off Thatcher's Island, your, your history for the, for the night. These are the last lighthouses to build, be built by the British in the United States, and they were built in 1771. And they're also the first lighthouses to mark not a harbor entrance, but a hazard. Okay, the trip back to Annapolis was wonderful. However, we were tested again at Port Jefferson. Uh, that's on Long Island due to yet another jam schedule. Um, we got in during fine weather from Newport, Rhode Island. The wind built from a Northeast to a steady 40 knot, 45 knots overnight, but we needed to make East River before they closed the river traffic while the United Nations was sitting which would delay us more than a week. Michelle had the final call and was downwind and turned out to be quite comfortable once we committed and got out and got sorted. And uh, from that, uh, you know, we basically discovered that pushing yourselves a little bit is not necessarily a bad thing. At the time, it might seem a little bit harsh, but uh, it just builds confidence. 
This is morning light as we trek southward from New York City to Cape May. This area is known for waves coming at different angles to the wind and seasickness is common. We prophylactically take Sturgeron if there's any consideration of seasickness. We do this because if one person goes down, it becomes solo sailing for the person left, which really demands a different strategy. Sunset off Atlantic City. If the weather is good and we're making good time, we sometimes decide to just carry on through the night as we did here. You can cover a lot of distance that way. And finally arrived in Annapolis for the boat show. This is an awesome in the water show uh, for a liveaboard cruiser. You will certainly reconnect with friends. We also took this as an opportunity for focused discussions on gear, et cetera, with the many experts that were showing their wares. By the way, that's Mahina on the left. Okay, with the boat show and hurricane season both finished, it's time to get south. Clearly it's getting too friggin' cold. These are our travel buddies, Pete and Tracy, on a really marvelous high latitude cruising boat, the Garcia Exploration 45, Pearl of Penzance. With a poor forecast, rather than going out and around Cape Hatteras, we entered the ICW at Norfolk and stayed inside through to Beaufort, North Carolina. Several folks listening have already done the ICW. It's pretty cool. And I re recommend that uh, you do it at least once. Thereafter, uh, we would go outside whenever possible, uh, ducking in just when it was necessary. Uh, we found that it was far more stressful staying alert in the narrow intercoastal waterway than sailing offshore with the autopilot on. Um, this is an ICW Pearl. There's a free app called Aquamap that comes with Explorer charts. And for a small fee, they add in the US Army Corps of Engineers data, uh, which is updated daily as surveys are done. You can see the USAS overlay in the image. It is totally worth it. Uh, the dotted track is from Bob423 and he's the editor of Waterway Guide. And you get that too. Um, the watermen on the ICW are generally very skilled, but it never hurts to call them up. This is where AIS and VHF integration can help facilitate direct bridge to bridge calls. Sometimes there were bigger ships to contend with. This is the Dwight D. Eisenhower in evolution leaving Norfolk. Mass, guns and planes win. Uh, a year later, we met a crew member and had a private tour aboard. As we moved into South Carolina, some other unusual craft were seen. These are duck blind boats heading home at about 30 knots. The ICW can be quite haunting and beautiful. We often started at false dawn and could travel up to 85 miles before sunset. Here we are nearing Myrtle Beach Sacristy Bridge. As dusk approached, something didn't look quite right. We had uh, tickled the last three bridges with our antenna and Though the tide was supposed to be falling, the water was most certainly rising and it hadn't rained that much. So most but not all bridges have air draft boards, Georgia being the exception. Um, here is the Sacristy Bridge and it showed 61.5 foot clearance. With a 64 foot air draft to the tip of our VHF antenna, we were clearly stuck as we couldn't get back under the previous bridges and we couldn't move forward. Pearl of Penzance and Mahina tied alongside a private wharf. After some inquiries, we met the owner and his wonderful family. The point of this segment is that there are unexpected pleasures that we became aware and open to once we were free of a schedule. We helped our hosts recover items from their destroyed house. It was destroyed from a major hurricane the previous month and got to know them over the eight days that we were tied alongside waiting for the water to drop. At about six days, we tried to, to get a bit creative. And this is the uh, Garcia 45, uh, showing that it's way too stiff to heal enough using a full dinghy with water in it and heat on the boom. It just wasn't gonna happen. Nice place for picture taking. But yippee. Um, note that the expensive wind instruments are off of the masthead. The VHF antenna was reversed and pointing downward beside the mast. Uh, 
Um, and we have now touched our antenna probably over a dozen times, but we've never done anything worse. And uh, so we would lead, lead the way with our antenna up. Uh, so we were the white stick, as it were. Time to make tracks. What started as a nice beam reach two-day passage from Brunswick, Georgia to St. Augustine, Florida, quickly evolved into four reaching in 40 knots. This was one of our tougher overnight passages. Big winds, confused seas meant that we had to sleep in the cockpit. We had to regroup to make sure that the watches and sleep happened through the afternoon and the evening so we'd be okay through the night. This is really important as fatigue can take over you quickly and there's really nothing for you to do. Once, once you're tired, you're tired. As it got dark and the weather continued to deteriorate, we also discovered that the third reef on the new mainsail was not placed deep enough. Also, current against wind resulted in deep breaking seas, which occasionally dumped a lot of water in the cockpit. Um, further to that, um, about 10 miles before we got to St. Augustine, our chart plotter stopped. On the plus side, we had a working VHF, um, PC navigation suite at the nav station, a working AIS transceiver, a uh, traditional compass and a paper chart. And best of all, we had Pearl of Penzance 10 nautical miles ahead. So Pearl waited for us and led us through the unmarked shifting shoals into the harbor. Towboat US also provides real-time radio guidance to areas like this, another reason to subscribe to them. Ah, oh, remember the third reef issue? Uh, this is a little bit of out, out of sequence because uh, it was a little bit later that I did this, but it was time to renew my sail making skills. And uh, although we carry a sail right sewing machine aboard, this was a job that needed a lot. And through the Ocean Cruising Club, I was able to get use of one. Note the size of the pneumatic machine. Uh, the chart plotter issue was uh, also known to the user community and eventually we had that solved too. Um, So this is the depth of the new fourth reef. You can also just make out the inner storm jib stay about a third of the way back from the bow. It intersects the mast just below the second spreaders. When the forecast suggests any kind of seas, we set this stay and the opposing check stays to steady the mast from pumping. St. Augustine is an absolutely awesome landfall, but especially so around the Christmas period. The music and arts community is amazing in both in this old Spanish city. Uh, there will be a large group of cruisers who gather here for Christmas and then south in the new year. With no home for Christmas, celebrating afloat was a fun diversion. So we finally made it down to Lauderdale uh, where we closely monitored the weather and listened to Chris Parker weather broadcasts on the single sideband radio. Uh, to cross the Gulf Stream to the Mackey Shoals in the Bahamas is about 125 miles. Standard practice is to leave around 2 a.m. so that you arrive on the edge of Bahama Bank after sunrise. Though less than 60 miles as the crow flies uh, across the Gulf Stream to the edge of the Bahamas Bank, uh, a, norther, a northerly wind of 15 knots is enough to cause very short, steep seas that are really not compatible with comfort uh, and can in fact be quite dangerous. There are numerous strategies to cross the current and it really depends on your boat and the weather. And that would take another hour to talk about. We sometime need, sometimes needed to use uh, the motor and we'd motor sail when we wanted to make a timing, like getting through the stream before the weather changed. Oh yeah, baby, we're in the Bahamas now. Uh, onward to the Exumas. They're the less crowded or developed island chain in the south part of the Bahamas. It's shallow in the Bahamas, but mostly sandy. But because it changes depths very slowly and you can see coral heads clearly during daylight, you'll soon be totally comfortable at hull speed in 12 feet of water. Uh, yep, this is really the color of the water. The Exuma's land and sea park covers several dozen islands and are truly spectacular. A good dinghy is critical. It's your commuter car and your recreational vehicle and has to work in all weather. Anchoring skills are critical. We have 225 feet of high cancel chain spliced into 300 feet of plate road. There's an 85 pound spade anchor on the end, 
Plus we have a 65 pound spare anchor on its own chain and road. Learning how to set an anchor and bridle together with an anchor alarm allows for a good night's sleep. Although this happens to be our travel buddy, Pete, as soon as we are anchored, we routinely, routinely go visit our new neighbors to tell them how we've anchored and ask if they're okay with it. We also tell them that we monitor channel 16 at night. There's so little chatter that it's not bothersome and it's allowed us to respond to several folks in trouble. Uh, this frequently is the icebreaker that opens the door to socializing and friendships. Did I say the Exumas are spectacular? And not too crowded? Most places. As alluded to earlier, the dinghy is the family car. This is a three meter rib with a 15 horsepower outboard on a grocery run at Staniel Key. Two stroke engines are the norm for liveaboards. It's not if your engine's gonna get dunked, but when it's gonna get dunked. And two stroke engines are easy to get running again. The supply ship comes to the Exuma communities every week or so. Uh, we loosely plan our resupply around its schedule. We carry two good sized waterproof backpacks for groceries and remove the packaging after checking out at the grocery store. That reduces storage space needed, garbage aboard, and prevents cockroaches from stowing away. Fronts come through about every five to seven days. And although there can often be upwards of 40 knots in the frontal and prefrontal winds, they predictably shift and drop fairly quickly. Uh, the maximum we saw, however, was uh, 98 knots at Staniel Key. I'm still amazed that we had a dodger at the end of that. We did, however, take the Bimini down before it hit. If you have a boat that likes to sail on its anchor like ours, or most hunters and many other boats, uh, this fin delta riding sail really works and it takes no time at all to set or strike. So this is what it's all about. The spectrum of interesting folks you'll meet is probably the best part of cruising. Um, it's there if you reach out like we do um, after anchoring. Uh, we also fly the Ocean Cruising Club Burgee, uh, which is kind of a rally sign for um, other members. We also met interesting people through repairing sails. In big anchorages like Georgetown, there are well-structured cruiser nets on the VHF every morning where people can request or offer services and announce events. I repaired sails for those in need uh, as there was no other sail maker in the Exumas. Uh, I certainly don't want to take work away from uh, existing businesses. Uh, it was a great way to meet people. I'm actually sewing a pair of pants in the picture though, and it's funny how they ended up looking like a storm jib. Uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention the other beasts besides the human variety. Some are everywhere, some are, some are a bit more reclusive, but it all adds to the charm of traveling. And uh, on the left are the swimming pigs of Staniel Key, on the right, the ever-present iguanas, the bird is a banana, uh, banana key, which is endemic to the Bahamas. Uh, it knew what boats were all about and immediately flew down below to check out what was in the galley. Um, we had birds landing on the rig or on deck during offshore passages too, often much bigger birds. Uh, this presentation of course, wouldn't be complete without the requisite picture of dolphins under the bow. And there are rays everywhere. This is a large common ray, but the eagle rays are really the belts of the ball. And nurse sharks are big, but they don't have big mouths. And uh, they're considered to be kind of like dogs by the locals. Here, Michelle, the safety elephant, is petting them. Uh, unfortunately, super yacht charters will sometimes chum the water and attract bull or tiger sharks. They are not as friendly, and neither are the sharks. Lots of boats come with pets. This is our friend's cat, Miss Rigby. She has her own blog and thousands of followers. Burmese cats are smart, curious, they can swim, and they don't take off when they get to shore. The perfect blend of a cat and dog that doesn't need to be taken to shore twice a day for a walk. Perfect on a boat. Um, she has her tend to her needs when her usual caregivers are away. Time to give back. We cruisers got together to clean up a beach. There's lots of garbage uh, pretty much everywhere now. And this kind of activity is both fun and much appreciated by the local community. In fact, the more we engaged with the local community, the more fun we had and the richer the experience. 
sometimes we would do laundry using two bare feet in a big laundry bucket. But when you have a shoreside facility like this, uh, this one's on Black Point Settlement, yeah, make use of it. Little local color. This is a Class C regatta at Farmer's Key. The racing rules are certainly more like guidelines and the racers are both vocal and passionate. The island was obtained by three former slave families whose descendants continue to run it. Note the sliding uh, hiking planks. Even when it's breezy, it's still great in the Exumas. The storm jib, jib has uh, become part of our working inventory. There are numerous plane wrecks and other features to snorkel or dive on. The piano at Rudder Key is compliments of David Copperfield. All good things come to an end. Hurricane season is not far behind us and we must head northward for safe cruising grounds. This shows how powered up the Saga 43 is while reaching in uh, along with its Solent jib and full mainsail. And it's very comfortable doing this. So what have we learned? This nomadic liveboard sailing life brings together all manner of folks and really highlights the richness, both of nature and people. There are challenges at times, but that often results in wonderful opportunities, or at least a good story. Overall, the operating cost was perhaps a third more than we had expected for the first year because the maintenance was extensive, though it has dropped way off for the sub subsequent two years. Um, thus ended our first year of cruising. We are now on our third year and have no plans to stop. If this interests you just a little, uh, don't let it be daunting. Try an autumn passage down the ICW, flip over to the Bahamas and spend the winter. It's not too tough and it's really, really rewarding. So that's the end of my presentation. I do wanna thank all the folks who have been beavering away, trying to keep me technically connected to you folks. Uh, it's been a bit of a challenge, and uh, but I think it's come off. So I, I really want to thank all those who are behind the scenes. And now back to Melanie. Well, don't go just yet. It's now time for questions. Um, first of all, thank you for a crazy, informative, and thorough presentation. That you know, I kept writing down questions, and then you'd answer them right away. I was like, oh, okay. Thank you for mentioning uh, the Voyager's Handbook because that's like the Bible of voyaging and sailing. And if anyone is thinking about buying a boat and sailing away, then that should be your number one uh, reference book. Uh, so we've got a couple of questions here. Um, one question for me that one of the first pictures that you showed was uh, you cleaning the hull or you resurfacing after cleaning the hull. Now I've never done it. It's always my husband, David, who does it, but is it true that things crawl in your ears as you're cleaning? <laughs> I've never had that happen. Uh, oh, you must thing, do it more often than we do. Well, actually, no, the, the thing is, um, if you scrape the hull, if you've got an ablative paint, which is what most people will be using, you don't want to scrape very much of that off. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so we use a steel scraper and very lightly dust over the surface. So you're not lifting lots of debris into the water. You really don't want to be doing that. And we, right. yeah, we've never had any issue like that. Yeah. I guess we just have critters that start living aboard with us. Well, the other thing is um, I, I don't cheap out at all on the anti-fouling. Uh, we've got, it, it costs a bit more, but it's, it's worth it. Yeah. Um, and we don't we don't get hard buildups and we get very little soft build. Um, another question is um, the meaning of Mahina. Ah, <laughs> so other sagas have had their names um, related to anything to do with the moon. So there was one called Luna, Moonstruck, various names. And so we thought, well, in keeping with that tradition, we'd like to get a name that had moon in it. Well, we're limited by what's available, and we're also limited by the fact that in Canada, you can't have uh, boats that have a name that already exists. You cannot do that. So we were searching around for names and uh, came across uh, the name Mahina, which is Tonganese or Hawaiian for goddess of the moon. 
Mm. which we thought was great. And we really loved it. We thought, okay, this is good. It's easy to say on the radio three times fast. Um, in addition to that, we put a symbol on the stern of Mahina, which was the Haida Indians uh, of Canada. And it's their symbol for the moon god. So we thought we'd get the blessing on both sides. Um, funny story, the first time we called Mahina on the radio, Mahina, 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 to a marina, um, they kept insisting that they were in fact the Marina and we weren't. <laughs> so, um, yeah. Uh, yeah. We, Best laid plans. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, so the name is definitely uh, stuck. And I'm sure it's uh, a good conversation starter in the Anchorages too. Yeah, sure. Not also, right welcome Michelle. Thank you for joining us. She's been here with us obviously through her pictures. So thank you for joining us for the questions. Um, we've got lots here. Um, Brian Williamson asks, it sounds like you spent a lot of time traveling. Did you return to Canada regularly to maintain citizenship status, citizenship status, healthcare tax status, that kind of thing? Um, Getting personal here. Yeah, we did travel back to Canada, but not for that reason. And not to hit those timings because we're we still remain deemed Canadian citizens, so we pay taxes in Canada, um, but um, we let our uh, health insurance lapse, and we carry Cigna insurance. There's a, uh, a plan that's not well known, but there is a plan that covers catastrophic only. And I'll tell you, when you go into the states, uh, the cost of insurance is just astronomical. So we said, okay, we'll self-insure except uh, in the U.S. And then we got Cigna and uh, they carried us and it's a month to month thing. So uh, we didn't have to worry about that. And so it provides coverage in wherever you are in the world? Uh, yes. And the other thing is there's a, another um, medevac capability called Diver Dan. And it's a hundred dollars a year for a family membership and they will airlift you anywhere you need to be airlifted in an emergency. Yeah. So, wow. uh, yeah, it, it was initially called Diaper Dan. I think it's now called Dan Boater. But again, money well spent. Yeah, 100 bucks, that's nothing. Yeah, right. and they actually, during, uh, we were quarantined in the Bahamas uh, during the initial days of COVID, and uh, they honored the policy. So, if we were unfortunate enough to have taken down by COVID, we would have at least known that we could have been here back, back to enhanced medical care if we needed it but we felt pretty safe where we were and stayed, stayed away as long as we possibly could <laughs> yeah that, we did too um we, you just feel safe on a boat you're not really interacting with people anyway that's so, right yeah um cameron clark says friends with me would like to know what a typical cruising budget would be to enjoy the bahamas say per <laughs> month <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's, it's it's about 10 percent more than you have <laughs> um i i would have to go back and look at that uh i really don't want to make a accurate call on that i have a comment on that though i think one of the things that you see very quickly when you're traveling is that everybody has their own uh tolerance or standard of living and it can be as expensive as you want it to be and it can be as frugal as you want it to be we met many boats uh, that were smaller than ours uh, and families of four who would fish uh, on a fairly regular basis for the protein, uh, partly because it was so enjoyable and partly because, uh, they, you know, here's the abundance of the sea that you can take advantage of. Um, and so those sorts of things make a difference to the cost. Uh, in addition to that, you can reduce your costs by avoiding or reducing the amount of time you spent at arenas or paint sprinkles, things like that. So you, you have some control over certain expenses and you make choices about what you're going to do. You know, what, what do you think your standard of living um, should be so that you have, you know, you're not, you're going to be gone for a while. It's, it's your home and you want to make sure that you're enjoying your home and not feeling like you're, you've been hard done by or, or you know, uh, you're missing out somehow. So most successful cruises that we see uh, allow for and budget for, you know, this little, enhancements and nice things just sort of you know reduce <laughs> you know dinner sure and those kinds of things but with a good balance of all the other things, so. yeah I mean if I had to do a, a 
really general look at it, I, I bet we were, um, once, once we got through all the, the really bad, uh, you know, breakdowns and the big expensive things in the first year, the second and third year were actually quite cheap. And I'm guessing uh, 2,500 a month, probably US, something like that. I'd be in that ballpark. And, and hi to Cameron. Cameron is our, uh, he's in the uh, presentation. He's our friend extraordinaire for all things fixable. Yeah. Uh, so. And even that, that isn't. <laughs> a miracle worker. Miracle worker. Great guy. I'll start reading the next question so that Ian and Michelle can start thinking about their respective answers. I think we should have his and hers answers for this one. <laughs> Uh-oh. Bring it on. <laughs> The question is, and you don't have to answer right away, besides a sense of humor, what item would you not leave Harbor without? Okay, so I'll take a stab at the first, first answer, um, non-technical answer. Um, Ian alluded to this in the talk. Uh, when we first started cruising, we very much still had our hats on as though we were still racing at, at the Ian Sailing Club and, and all the pressures that come with that, the expectations. And I think that the longer we cruised and the more familiar we got with the boat, certainly the second year of our cruising, um, we began to realize that the, the journey is as important as the destination. So the schedule, uh, aside from the schedule dictating concerns about weather and so forth, that it, you need to set guidelines um, and not a plan. And if you have a guideline approach to things, I would not leave port anymore with that sort of guidelines as opposed to the schedule. By that, I mean that, you know, by having guidelines, you actually have a considerable amount of flexibility when opportunity presents um, or something that's not an opportunity, just a series of unfortunate events. And so by being a little flexible, it increases your uh, quality of life considerably. Uh, it opens opportunities to meet people to say yes, um, when you would have otherwise said no, because you created you know, this sort of schedule that, you know, once, once you retire, you begin to realize, wait a minute, I'm the boss of me. There is no schedule. Um, and that, that is, the, I'd say, the biggest thing that you need to get to quick. Uh, and then you'll really be having this experience. Um, for me, the one thing I wouldn't leave or without, um, Cameron on speed dial, <laughs> probably. Water um, maker. <laughs> Actually, we also have um, we have ten binders of of information on all the systems on the boat, and that's critical. It's great to say, "Oh, I can pick it up off the internet and get the latest and greatest." Yeah, you might not be able to. And uh, to actually have the binders that are all indexed that I can look up detailed information of all the systems really was helpful. And uh, not just when things are are in the mire. Even you know when you're actually having some downtime and you want to figure out well how exactly does the water maker work and you know what does that filbert flange connect to and uh, so that's I think if I had to say uh, yeah make sure that you make sure you've got good good manuals and also keep a um, really really detailed record of all work that you're doing on the boat. Yeah, agreed. Yeah, it's good to have the captain's log or the maintenance log and all that kind of stuff. Star date 25. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> uh, another question is, how did you choose your sailing area? Like where you were going to sail to? Why the Eastern US versus the Southern Caribbean or Europe? Um, and do you have plans to continue living aboard? I think you already said that that is a definite go as soon as vaccines happen. Well, Ian alluded to this also in the talk that when we set out on this uh, adventure, we had a five-year plan, but with one-year one year renewals where we would sit down and say, hey, is this still meeting our needs? Uh, is where we're sailing where we want to be? Uh, do we want to add something, move something, or those kinds of things? Um, yeah, and the, sort of the, the practicality was we were going to head south the, the initial plan was to head south to the Bahamas and then possibly deeper into the Caribbean. Uh, and after that, the next year launch to Great Britain. And uh, 
course, with Hurricane Irma, that changed everything. So we instead said, okay, let's go north during the summer because uh, you certainly weren't going to go south into the hurricane season. So we went north and enjoyed Maine and then headed south. And because we had started basically from Maine instead of from Chesapeake Bay, it was a, a bit longer haul. And so we got down to the Bahamas and then said, you know, this is pretty nice here and there's a lot to see. So we didn't make the big push down. Plus that year there was a lot of breakdowns. That was the year that we had to do all the fixing. So it was great to be able to come back to the U.S., do the repairs. And the plan was going to be the following season, go across the Atlantic. And so here, because of COVID, we're, we're stuck in Ottawa. We're Sorry, we have the opportunity to enjoy <laughs> Ottawa through the lovely cold, wet winter. Um, thank you, Richard. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but now what we'd like to do is get the boat uh, back in the water and it will probably be next spring will be the weather window to cross the North Atlantic. All right. Uh, yes, we're all patiently waiting <laughs> to get back <laughs> to our boats. <laughs> um, Valencia asked, uh, well, she says, you mentioned that the Saiga 43 is fast. Just how fast are we talking? Um, Paul and Lori <laughs> responded too fast, LOL. <laughs> the the uh, PHRF rating for it is 83, I believe. Um, so we can we can be reaching in double digits quite easily. Um, our pulse speed going upwind is 7.3. Um, on a reach, it's really easy to be doing eight, nine, 10, 11 knots. It's, uh, and it's it's also really comfortable. You're not getting jostled around. It's a very because it's narrow, it just slices through the water. And uh, as it hits a wave, um, a lot of boats will be slowed down substantially when they, when they pound into a wave. Um, we just kind of cut through it. And uh, so it's, it is a notably different motion. An example of that was uh, we did a passage to the Bahamas, I think it was the last one. And, uh, you know, it was, it was waves and it was windy uh, and, you know, nothing too dramatic. But when we arrived, other boats had a completely different experience or had a different feel for that exact same journey. It really came down to how their boats behave. Versus and you guys said you have quite a lean. Um, no, it just means we, we have to reef a little bit earlier. We don't we don't let it heal, um, you know, crazy amounts. Uh, but it, again, it's just because it's a a um, narrow boat it doesn't get pushed around by the waves as badly. It cuts through them rather than goes over them a lot of time. And mm -hmm. uh, you might think that makes it wet and probably maybe it makes it a little bit more wet than uh, some of the more modern boats, but uh, certainly not in a bad way because you've got this great big dodger that covers most of the cockpit. And I like to dry. <laughs> so no regrets on the boat choice. No, no. I mean, if I had a million dollars, would I choose something different? <laughs> yeah, maybe. But for the budget that we had, I don't think you can beat it for what's us. The, what's the one thing that you would change about your boat if money was no object? On your boat, though, keeping your boat? Um, probably put a carbon fiber rig in it, which was an option, but only one boat ever did it. Um, but again, that would stiffen it up quite a bit. Michelle, do you differ? <laughs> Um, Can you answer? Well, you know, it, there, there's two different approaches to this. Um, I think there's the when you're sailing what you want boat, very different than what you want when you're at anchor or you're stationary. Um, you know, when you're stationary or anchored, the bigger, the better, the more room, the more everything. Catamarans look so attractive. Uh, however, once you're out sailing and, you know, you're in challenging seas, you're happy not to have some of the other boats because some that are beamier or have other uh, struck other designs um, are not having the same experience. So I think it really depends on where. So sometimes I want it to be bigger, more luxurious. Sometimes I'm like, no, this is just fine. So uh, there's a definitive answer. I did say that there was a Saga 48, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's a bit more than the two-foot-itis. Yeah, a little bit. 
<laughs> That's what happens in cruising boats, I think, yeah. when you're living aboard. It's more like five to 10 foot itis. Yeah, mine is a 55 foot itis. <laughs> <laughs> the thing is, as, as you get to these bigger cruising boats, the costs really do become exponential. And I think for us, we're in the sweet spot right now. I don't feel that we are um, poor for owning this boat. We can, we can manage it. I think that ties into a question you asked earlier too, that um, when consider what the costs are, part of that cost is, you know, if you've sunk all your money into a boat and all your money to maintain the boat, there's no money left for you to, uh, to do shore-based travel, to you know, make other choices, to kind of have a more balanced approach to life. So you're living on the boat. It's not a big issue. Um, and so you, if that matters, then that's a huge consideration about what you choose. It's like being house poor, I guess, equipment on land. Yeah. Yeah. My husband started doing like boat consulting services because we went through the same process of buying a boat. And I'm sure, as you mentioned in your presentation, there's like so much just like boat porn, as we say. <laughs> um, you're just constantly on Yacht World looking at all the listings. And, you know, when you do make the decision it's not just the base price you need to think about it's all of the you know maintenance work and upgrades and if the boat's been sitting for too long then everything's going to need changing and yeah, it costs a lot of money that that first year yeah well first actually year. that reminds me um there is a website it's a, a cheap subscription but it's called attainable adventure cruising and uh this is the boat morning cloud and they're down in uh, Nova Scotia right now. They, they have been cruising for decades and uh, they've put together basically an online forum with books and it covers in detail. Um, he's an engineer. And so he covers in detail the real nitnoid stuff that you might wanna know about, you know, electrical charging and uh, you know, all these kind of really hard to grapple with issues as well as does some travelogue stuff. And uh, he's, he's a bit opinionated and he's not always right, but other people kind of get online and, and straighten him out. Um, but he does provide a service and makes you think and makes you, you know, think through what they're talking about. So that's another one to put in, uh, in the back pocket as being probably a worthwhile, uh, especially while, when you own a boat, but, but before as well. Um, everyone's taking notes at home, I assume. <laughs> well, okay, back to the question about what would you not leave home? I just thought of one uh, without um, Aquamaps. We didn't find Aquamaps until we were a little ways down the ICW the first. And once we found it, what a difference. Um, you know, we, we draw six foot eight. There are lots of places in the ICW where that is tremendous challenge. And once you have that app and you uh, U.S. Army Corps of Engineer overlay and Bob423 get to his Facebook page and get his updates. All that information uh, makes uh, for a much different experience. You don't encounter problems in the same because they're giving you a heads up and the app is giving you a heads up about what exactly plays for you. And so you can uh, adjust accordingly. So must have awesome, highly recommend. All right. Um, another question kind of similar to that is how much did your mast height limit your ICW tra travel? Um, it really didn't. Uh, there's only one bridge that is absolutely not going to work and it's <laughs> down near Miami, but we didn't want to go to Miami anyway. So that didn't matter. Well, um, there are a couple of short bridges that you have to pay attention and we would try to time the tide and so on uh, to make sure we had the, the best clearance. But we would, we would tickle the bottom of some of these bridges with our antenna. Um, and I said, I think we've done that probably a dozen times in the last three years. So we're close, but we've, and, and we watch the board heights uh, and they're, they're accurate. So uh, if, it's, if it's too short, then we would, we would have to turn around. Uh, yet the only time we've been you know, truly stopped was at that one time at Sockisty Bridge, which I described. So, you know, you can do it. You absolutely can do it. 
And otherwise, you just practice the healing over trick. <laughs> well, we, we could heal our boat if we needed to, but we were traveling in company with Pearl of Benzance. And uh, so we, we uh, hung around. I'm glad we did. There you go. Yeah, you, they, they kind of helped you out at the end there. Um, any recommendations on must-have training for cruising down to the Caribbean? You know, I don't know. Michelle might have Caribbean. some thought about that. But... I don't know about Caribbean because we were in the Bahamas. So um, I think that there's a couple of things uh, that you really need to make sure you have before you go to the Bahamas. Number one is to make sure you have the correct maps that you're using, um, which is the Explorer, Explorer charts. Explorer charts are the only ones that are absolutely balls on accurate or feel like they are. Um, the others are a little hit and miss. And so when you hear people who've had problems, problems going to different uh, openings or entering areas, it's often related to the fact that they're using the wrong charts. Um, Aquamaps, again, has that as a feature loaded right in. So you don't have to change your navigation equipment at all. Um, just use the secondary device to do a little bit of uh, free research before you go to the. Um, the only other thing I'd say that when, um, you know, before we left to go to the Bahamas, you really want to have a good talk about what your tolerances are or, you know, what you're prepared to sail in, what you're prepared to not sail. Because at the end of the day, you both have to um, and it's a very small boat if you're not getting along with each other. So having clear understanding of uh, each other's tolerance is, is probably the most important thing you want to make sure you have before you leave. Um, and, uh, discussions around uh, one of our friends, Pete, had a great one. They said basically anyone could uh, place the red card uh, and you didn't have to explain the why. It was just, you know, I'm not comfortable and I'm laying down my red card. And, uh, you know, for, for what it's worth, it makes a difference. Yeah, but I mean, moving back to training courses or training, it, it, particularly to the Bahamas, I don't think you do need any uh, formal training if you're reasonably competent on the water. Um, the safety at sea is always a nice course to have if you're going to go offshore. But um, at least to the Bahamas and the U.S. East Coast, I think you're you, you can you're, you're close enough to um, shore to harbors that you don't really need to go take a yacht master course, for instance. Um, you know, nice to have certainly, but I I think you're probably pretty good. A basic navigation course would be useful, and yeah. uh, anything you with a radio have, course too. Yeah, you need to have your radio course. Uh, uh, other than that, um, I, I don't see any any of that as an impediment. If you're um, reasonably handy sailing around uh, um, Lake Duchene, you'll do fine. Excellent. All right, um, we are getting close to nine o'clock, so I'm just going to ask you a couple of last questions. Um, Ross said that when you had the four boats there, there was one that you said would have been completely inappropriate. What, why do you say that? Oh, <laughs> uh, that was the, the Santa Cruz 50, which is a race boat. And in fact, I raced a Santa Cruz 50 in Transpac. And uh, it's for a number of reasons, it isn't a good boat. Uh, one is that it's got a really long forefoot and going upwind, it will pound like crazy. It is a downwind boat. Uh, the second is that the way the cockpit is set up, you couldn't really put a bimini, uh, a workable bimini in there. And that sounds kind of namby-pamby, but if you're in a place like the Caribbean, uh, you really need to stay out of the sun. You need a bimini. And you also need a way to get out of the weather. You know, great in a race boat. You don't have a Dodger. You don't have a bit. Uh, cruising, yeah, not so much. You, you, you're get, not getting paid enough to uh, <laughs> hang out in the bad weather. Yep. And if you're spending all that time in the sun, it does catch up with you. <laughs> it does. A lot of required naps. Indeed. Um, all right. 
One minute answers each for the last three questions. Number one, is that a Bristol cutter behind Michelle? Ian makes model ships. <laughs> and this is one of about Oh, I don't know. That's the, the boat is Puritan. It was a, an America's Cup boat that was from Marblehead, Massachusetts. I built the hull when I was in Af in uh, Bosnia. Cool. Uh, Dale asks, do you ever take extra crew for extended passages? <laughs> well, for the, uh, for the Atlantic crossing, in fact, um, we do have uh, crew who are going to come on board for that. And uh, very experienced crew, in fact, who have done crossings before. So uh, for that, um, and we bring guests every once in a while for a week or more. Um, it's, uh, yeah, that's how it works. Okay, so you need to befriend Ian and Michelle this summer to get on their crew. Uh, last question is a bit technical, possibly. Are you able to physically manage a Sega 43, the sheets and the sails without power winches and a windlass? The answer is, could we? Absolutely, we could. We do, however, have a single power winch, um, and that makes it much easier. The, the windlass, if it fails, which it has, uh, we can lift up the anchor using the primary winches and a hook and a rope. So, it, so the, the, the short answer is I wouldn't want to do it for a long time, uh, particularly lifting an 85 pound anchor with chain, but the actual sailing um, would be quite easy to do without a uh, power winch. Uh, as I said, the, we have one, it sits on the cabin top and it's for halyards and sheet um, and, and main sheet uh, and reefs. Uh, the primaries for the, for the, wind, for the uh, jibs are really easy. They're manual, they're simple. Cool. Well, we got through all of our questions and finished before nine o'clock. So uh, congratulations and uh, thank you so much for sharing your story with us. And uh, we all have our fingers crossed that you can uh, carry on with your plans. And um, also thank you for the very valuable lessons. There were, there were lots of goodies in there for people to, to take home. and. Um, yeah, I hope uh, everyone can join us again next week. We've got another presentation lined up and uh, hope everyone has a good night. Thanks so much. <laughs> My pleasure. Bye.